The term metaphysical poets was coined by the critic Samuel Johnson to describe a loose group of 17th century English poets whose work was characterized by the inventive use of conceits, and by a greater emphasis on the spoken rather than lyrical quality of their verse. These poets were not formally affiliated and few were highly regarded until 20th century attention established their importance. Given the lack of coherence as a movement, and the diversity of style among poets, it has been suggested that calling them Baroque poets after their era might be more useful. Once the metaphysical style was established, however, it was occasionally adopted by other and especially younger poets to fit appropriate circumstances. In the chapter on Abraham Cowley in his Lives of the Most Eminent English Poets 1779-81, Samuel Johnson refers to the beginning of the 17th century in which there, appeared a race of writers that may be termed the metaphysical poets. This does not necessarily imply that he intended, metaphysical, to be used in its true sense, in that he was probably referring to a witticism of John Dryden, who said of John Donne. He affects the metaphysics, not only in his satires, but in his amorous verses, where nature only should reign, and perplexes the minds of the fair sex with nice speculations of philosophy, when he should engage their hearts, and entertain them with the softnesses of love. In this, Mr. Cowley has copied him to a fault. Probably the only writer before Dryden to speak of the new style of poetry was Drummond of Hawthornden, who in an undated letter from the 1630s made the charge that, some men of late, transformers of everything, consulted upon her reformation, and endeavored to abstract her to metaphysical ideas and scholastical quiddities, denuding her of her own habits, and those ornaments with which she hath amused the world some thousand years. Johnson's assessment of, metaphysical poetry, was not at all flattering. The metaphysical poets were men of learning, and, to show their learning was their whole endeavor, but, unluckily resolving to show it in rhyme, instead of writing poetry, they only wrote verses, and, very often, such verses as stood the trial of the finger better than of the ear, for the modulation was so imperfect, that they were only found to be verses by counting the syllables. The most heterogeneous ideas are yoked by violence together, nature and art are ransacked for illustrations, comparisons, and allusions, their learning instructs, and their subtlety surprises, but the reader commonly thinks his improvement dearly bought, and, though he sometimes admires, is seldom pleased. Johnson was repeating the disapproval of earlier critics who upheld the rival canons of Augustan poetry, for though Johnson may have given the metaphysical, school, the name by which it is now known, he was far from being the first to condemn 17th-century poetic usage of conceit and wordplay. John Dryden had already satirized the Baroque taste for them in his Mac Fleckno and Joseph Addison, in quoting him, singled out the poetry of George Herbert as providing a flagrant example. 20th Century Recognition during the course of the 1920s, T.S. Eliot did much to establish the importance of the metaphysical school, both through his critical writing and by applying their method in his own work. By 1961 A. Alvarez was commenting that, it may perhaps be a little late in the day to be writing about the metaphysicals. The great vogue for Dunn passed with the passing of the Anglo-American experimental movement in modern poetry. After their two decades later, a hostile view was expressed that emphasis on their importance had been an attempt by Eliot and his followers to impose a high Anglican and royalist literary history on 17th century English poetry, but Colin Burroughs' dissenting opinion, in the Oxford Dictionary of National Biography, is that the term, metaphysical poets, still retains some value. For one thing, Don's poetry had considerable influence on subsequent poets, who emulated his style. And there are several instances in which 17th century poets use the word metaphysical in their work, meaning that Samuel Johnson's description has some foundation in the usage of the previous century. However, the term does isolate the English poets from those who shared similar stylistic traits in Europe and America. Since the 1960s, therefore, it has been argued that gathering all of these under the heading of Baroque poets would be more helpfully inclusive. There is no scholarly consensus regarding which English poets or poems fit within the metaphysical genre. In his initial use of the term, Johnson quoted just three poets, Abraham Cowley, John Donne, and John Cleveland. Colin Burrow later singled out John Donne, George Herbert, Henry Vaughan, Andrew Marvell, and Richard Crashaw as central figures, while naming many more, all are part of whose work has been identified as sharing its characteristics.
Twoki anthologists in particular were responsible for identifying common stylistic traits among 17th century poets. Herbert Grierson's Metaphysical Lyrics and Poems of the 17th Century, 1921, was important in defining the metaphysical canon. In addition, Helen Gardner's Metaphysical Poets, 1957, included proto metaphysical writers such as William Shakespeare and Sir Walter Raleigh and, extending into the Restoration, brought in Edmund Waller and Rochester. While comprehensive, her selection, as Burrow remarks, so dilutes the style as to make it, virtually coextensive with 17th century poetry. Late additions to the metaphysical canon have included sacred poets of both England and America who had been virtually unknown for centuries. John Norris was better known as a Platonist philosopher. Thomas Traherne's poetry remained unpublished until the start of the 20th century. The work of Edward Taylor, who is now counted as the outstanding English-language poet of North America, was only discovered in 1937. Characters. Free from former artificial styles. Grierson attempted to characterize the main traits of metaphysical poetry in the introduction to his anthology. For him it begins with a break with the formerly artificial style of their antecedents to one free from poetic diction or conventions, Johnson acknowledged as much in pointing out that their style was not to be achieved, by descriptions copied from descriptions, by imitations borrowed from imitations, by traditional imagery and hereditary similes. European Baroque influences, including use of conceits. Wordplay and wit. Platonic influence. Ideas of platonic love had earlier played their part in the love poetry of others, often to be ridiculed there, although Edward Herbert and Abraham Cowley took the theme of platonic love more seriously in their poems with that title. In the poetry of Henry Vaughan, as in that of another of the late discoveries, Thomas Traherne, neoplatonic concepts played an important part and contributed to some striking poems dealing with the soul's remembrance of perfect beauty in the eternal realm and its spiritual influence.